Hello there, my name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. With sport fishing, conservation and new challenges all big growth areas so far as sea angling goes, saltwater fly fishing, and in particular fly fishing for bass, looks set to increase in popularity. Maybe not so much amongst out-and-out sea anglers, but certainly with some groups of established fly fishing purists who currently fish for freshwater species throughout the UK. And no doubt there will also be sea anglers out there too willing to give it a go, particularly those who already have an interest in either bass, sport fishing or both. So to help satisfy what could develop into an ever-increasing demand, several years ago now, Chichester-based IGFA guide Justin Anvil took up the challenge of offering pro-guided fly fishing trips, both boat and shore, exclusively targeting bass. Looking back now in 2012, has that fulfilled the early promise that you obviously saw when the concept first came to mind, and how did it all come about? Prior to starting the Saltwater Fly Fishing School off the South Coast, we um, worked in the City of London for many years, and that career came to an end. I manoeuvred myself out of a a partnership in the bank and had a, a desire to do something completely different. So I moved back to this village, which is where I grew up in North London. I knew the coastline fairly well, but really the establishment of the school was almost by default. I was taking a full year off from a fairly high octane business career but in the meantime I registered a couple of very powerful generic domain names at the height of the Nasdaq boom one of which was bassfishing.co.uk and I developed that with a web designer to uh, the point where you see it today and I was staggered that I did a bit of an experiment about 2003 I think it was within four months of leaving and coming back to the coast And within a day of launching the website into the live environment, I had an inquiry as to, can you guide me bass fishing? Which I think was the very first introduction to guided bass fishing. And from that, obviously, I there was a bit of a rush on in terms of getting qualified on a vessel for inshore waters, which I I did my um, qualifications. But it was, like I said, it wasn't supposed to be that way. It was supposed to be me chilling out for a year. And then suddenly it became apparent that what I was wanted to do myself was strangely enough what many people as well wanted to experience and from there it built into a full-time guiding job which I I guide up to 250 days a year now and up to 500 clients a year which has been full since 2003. It sounds potentially busy particularly as it's seasonal so give us then a flavour of that seasonality in terms of the actual fishing. I work from 1st of April to the end of October the main reason why um, I do that is not necessarily because you cannot hook up in the winter months. Because you can and fish are resident is because of the clemency of the weather. I think from March, April, May, it's always a transient period in the calendar. June, July, August, September and October, they are your working months whereby you, you know, you're, you're probably more than likely to get out onto the sea than you are not. And also, I think that water temperatures are, when it comes to specifically fly fishing, very important. There are a number of parameters which are important, but certainly as a cold-blooded species that you're targeting, you know, it's, it's highly relevant to the, to the temperature around its, its, its environment. So chasing a fly, this is where a lot of people sometimes get it wrong. There are, there are a number of mediums to catch a sea bass, bait, spinner, soft bait, you name it. But remember that the mediums by which you're contacting them are visual. Um, and in order for it to chase, it needs to be motivated, which is directly correlated to its external environment. Winter months when the sea temperatures are knocking four or five degrees would probably suggest that that fish is much, much slower, much more lethargic and scavenging more than chasing and hunting. And when you fly fish, I think you've got a better than average chance when your water temperatures are plus 13, 14 degrees. Certainly 16 degrees is a trigger point whereby it's actively seeking to hunt you down. And that is something that obviously occurs parallel with the spring, summer and autumn season. And what about fallback situations for those days when there's just too much wind for the boat to either safely or comfortably go out? We chill out. The reason why you book every day is because you will be gifted by God wind which is going to skunk you on that day. So if you try and say, okay, I'm always going to have Sundays off or I'm going to have Saturdays off or my midweek date is a Wednesday, you'll be guaranteed that the weather is clement five knots southwest and you should be good to go. So you tend to not juggle with that probability knowing that um, wind will be an issue at some point on the calendar. And when you're not guiding here in the UK, I believe you also have other equally appealing alternatives on offer. 
Out of the school, we sieve water and we chase fins around as much as we can because that's what people want to do. We try and educate them to a, to a degree, and we have a, a casting school which is specifically geared towards distance casting, tip speed, line speed, double hauling effectively, so people are more competent on the sea. And uh, the biggest shocker for most people when being introduced to it for the first time is the negative impact a wind or an onshore breeze can have, or indeed how dangerous it can be if you're not used to reversing your cast or gauging exactly gust speeds. We try and teach them how to harness the breeze to the best of their ability. So, so there are a number of aspects to the school. The first one is obviously we, we want to guide them onto fish. The second one is we need actually a bit of wind when we're teaching them double hauling. So sometimes that acts as a wicket keeper to a bad day. Um, the client is always offered the chance to convert his day if it's going to be unproductive on the sea to uh, doing his casting courses or indeed you know we travel now quite extensively to the eastern seaboard and have done for the last six seven years to chase the larger striped bass species around as well as false albacore and bluefish which occurs really from june through to the end of october so there are three aspects to uh, what has been developed over the last nine or ten years from your experience then just how effective is fly fishing in comparison to other approaches for european sea bass it's an interesting question I think you catch a better class of fish on a bait or, or a lure. Uh, there's an element to bass fishing which needs to be recognised, which is, I think, you know, don't get me wrong, we caught some pretty substantial fish on flies and not always the large flies, but I think there's a risk-reward element there. If you're working very structured ground where you know good fish are holding, I think a bait or a live bait or a large soft bait will take a better predator out. So I think you can catch a lot of fish on a fly, without a doubt. I think you catch a lesser class of fish on a fly, generally. We tend to increase our fly size according to the season. So in September and October, when the flies had nearly a full season to grow, we're using, you know, four-row deceivers or flat wings of 12, 14 inches long, which seems to raise a better quality fish. So, But we're never working directly in parallel with a soft bait. So it's always very difficult to benchmark who's doing better. I did a couple of experiments over the last uh, nine seasons, which I bet against myself, and I was always very surprised that the ratio was positive in terms of the fly. But what you don't see is what you miss, and the ratio at its best was 8 to 1 in favour of fly over lure. Well, I think it was 24 bass to 8 bass in, in favour of the fly. Um, but these are, these are school bass, up to 2.5 pounds, something like that, and you never quite see what rejects you. And since those experiments, I've noticed in good clean water on neap tides, you know, how many times you can get frequently tracked by 55 to 60 centimetre fish, but they will not take you out. So although you're, the statistic is telling you something, and the reality might be telling you something else, but to summarise, I think fly fishing is a fantastic medium to contact sport fish in the school bass and the larger bass range when you can hook up to them. But you need an, a lot on your side when you're dealing with a fly. I mean, and there's something that this will lean into later on, but people seem to forget that a fish contacts you through the nares on its nose, through its lateral line and through sight. And you have automatically knocked out two of those major medians for that fish to contact you. It's not going to feel your fly, and it's definitely not going to smell your fly through its nose. And therefore, you're left to one out of three mediums in which it needs to contact you, and that is visual interpretation. So whereby sometimes a bait fisherman will enjoy an onshore breeze where it's smashing crustacea up against the foreshore, and it looks like a cod sea out there with a lot of sediment in it. I'm not saying they don't see the fly in turbid water, but what I'm saying is that in order for that fish to contact you, and I think their killing window is about 30 cubic feet, because I've noticed fish come into me at 30 feet away from the fly, obviously the water con needs to be clean. Are there not tricks you can use to advantage in turbid water, such as surface poppers, to play into the bass's other prey detection abilities, such as vibration? Yes, you can, you know, without a doubt. But the problem is, if you're, if you're working in turbid water, it's either you, you've been in or you're working in an environment which is still a bad working environment for fly fishermen, and that turbidity is caused by the attrition of the seabed against current or indeed against um, the energy of the waves hitting the beach. So we tend to find that if you're using a popper, you're going to be isolated probably better during clement, clean weather than you are when there's a lot of disturbance on the water top anyway. Uh, so if you're working over structured ground that you think may well hold good quality fish, to put a popper through in still conditions 
is a, I think, a bad way of hooking up to a fish because we have more strikes and less hookups. But as soon as you get a hit, you switch immediately to a more traditional pattern to get it maybe down and put it through its lair. Um, so it's a very good way of testing a piece of water. But even so, we find on prolific fisheries, such as the Eastern Seaport, to use a popper, works when the conditions are still conducive to using flies generally rather than pocket flies so yes you, you're going to add one angle of the fish being able to locate you but remember there's still a lot of disturbance on the water top anyway especially if the capillary rays are smashing all over the place so it's a double-edged sword and are there perhaps situations in which a fly might offer a better chance of success than more traditional bussing techniques i think um, fly fishing generally although i should be careful the way i say this is <laughs> you're making it very difficult for yourself if I'm going to be honest about it, you know, you're using a fly, you're restricted in terms of technically being able to project and work water comprehensively. So, you know, it's, it's a difficult one. I think the biggest driver for a lot of people coming into the sport is that you can match uh, the maturity of your fishery against a piece of equipment which gives you a tremendous fight. So even if you're hooking up to two and a half to three and a half pound school bass or even smaller than that, if you have the conditions on your side that you can reduce your AFTM rating down to a six weight rod, you get a natural high from hooking into that type of fish. Because we've all done sea fishing and everything has its place, but to overman the kit in relation to the quarry species is not always the best thing to do or indeed the, the, the most enjoyable thing to do. So I think you know one of the biggest uh, drivers for it is that you're using kit which is conducive to and also remember, you know, if you're using an eight weight, which will be a standard piece of kit and a fast taper rod, you get as much enjoyment um, over hooking into school bass, but it will still handle a fish up to 15 to 18 pound, no problem at all. So you've got the best of both worlds. You know you're looking for that quality female throughout the whole year, and you could get one shot at it. You're not undergunned when you do meet her. You have that on your side. And I think for me, although you're making it harder, I think the enjoyment you get from it when you score well is exponentially increased. One of the main problems with overgunning at sea, and here I'm talking about conventional bait fishing now, is having strong ties to contend with, which is a problem that I assume will also affect fishing the fly. Heavier lines, and more so large weighty flies, are in my experience not the easiest of tools to work with. Yeah, we tend to want, and for anyone that is interested in, in the techniques we use, we tend to keep our, firm, uh, our feet firmly on terra firma on a spring tide cycle, where the tidal flow is extremely aggressive. And we love working the neap cycles where the tidal flow may be up to 50 to 60 percent reduced. The line profiles are anything from, or densities I should say, are anything from an intermediate line to a 700 grain tip. So everyone loves using wristy gear and, and the lighter lines because visually, if the fish are breaking on top, then you can see and interpret exactly what's going on. When you're working tidal stream and you want to work the water column comprehensively, you have to get down to them and bring them up through. If you're working in 15 feet of water and you're only working an intermediate line which is sinking at one inch per second, which is one inch per second on slack, which is on a neat tide as maximum of 30 minutes to 45 minutes, you're going to be missing an awful lot of potential below you if you're not working a dense line. Not as enjoyable to work that dense line to sieve water and to dredge effectively. But remember, those fish generally come up on slack. So for six out of seven hours, they're hunkering down, waiting for food to go over the top, which is why a bass has eyes on the top of its head, because it's continually looking up to intercept food. And I think they're pretty lazy. So, you know, you have a number of things which are going against you. And one of the things which is always going against you is they may well be motivated to feed when they're hunkering down, taking opportunities going over the top of them on tidal drift. You still have to meet them. And to, to be technically on your game in a three and a half to four knot current and to get your line into that killing zone is more testing than it would be just trying to double haul a floating line out there. So we love the neap ties because the tidal flow is still there, but it's, it's semi-reduced. Your water column is extremely clean, or should be, because the tidal attrition rate has been reduced. And you're matching the median to contact the fish, which is fly fishing, to its environment, which is conducive for it to finding you. I mean, there is a distinct difference between presenting a fly to a fish, which by opportunity as a predator will take you out if it's near enough to it. That scenario, over and above another scenario, which is that fish is actively hunting you down, is completely different. And if you are you know, lucky enough to witness shoals of bass actively seeking food, they are extremely aggressive. So what I'm saying is, in turbid water, whereby the window opportunity on the 
fish's behalf is greatly reduced, you have exponentially reduced your opportunity for it to find you. So if you're working a 90 foot line of which you know that within 30 cubic feet of where that fly hits, that fish may well contact you. If you're working a big tide and the turbidity is too great, you may have reduced that by 70%. So when I'm talking about working water very comprehensively, you're also having to gauge when it's best on your side to do so, or if you interpret that in reverse, when not to bother. It's not that the fish aren't there. The fish are probably there, but to contact you is a major advantage when the fish are actually on your side to be able to find you, not you find them. And we find that we tend to score heavily on neap cycles and intermediate cycles. It's not that we don't score on springs, but I would say that the action is very frenetic on spring tides. It's on and it's off extremely quickly, which effectively is the bait stream pushing through at double quick time. So you can hook up to a dozen bass relatively quickly, then you sit there waiting for another pot of food to go through. On a neat tide, it's greatly reduced, which means that the fish are not easier to contact, but they're slower moving. They have probably, a, um, what I've noticed is over the many seasons I've been doing it, is that if you find food on a neat tide, so is the predator, and it's done something which will lean towards what the fry does, which it should never do, which is if you find food on a neap tide, the fry has more control in tidal stream. And it does what it should never do, which is to ball up. And it gets concentrated, which merely concentrates a food source for a predator, which means that if it's moving slower and there's more of it, you're probably going to find there's a pot of fish which are hammering it and annihilating it, which gives you a better opportunity. Unlike the spring tides, where you get food and always try and bring it back to food, food washing through relatively quickly, which means a predator will wash through relatively quickly. You can hook up, and then you're sitting there thinking, where do they go? Well, they've just gone down tight. So as a fly fisherman, I think sometimes it's very interesting to look at the catch records in relation to the lunar cycle. Without a doubt, we caught more fish on spring tides when the food movement is more aggressive, but they're smaller, and it happens very quickly. The best hookups we've had happen over a longer period in time on a better quality fish. And I would be very interested to know if other people, because remember, that is not the traditional way of doing it. The traditional way of doing it is to do it on a spring tide, on an onshore breeze, where there's a lot of crab, crustacean, shrimp, which have been bust up against the foreshore, and the foraging fish will be right under your feet. To contact those fish as a fly fisherman is extremely difficult, in my opinion. So you're going on the reverse end of what a bait fisherman may well say, well, I've never done it that way around. Well, remember, we're using two different styles of trying to contact the predator. And were conditions either dictate or permit, do you, or perhaps your weaker clients, ever resort to using the drift to snake out extra line to enhance the horizontal coverage? The problem on a drift is, for a relative novice who's technically not on his game yet, is that... By definition, you have wind on your back. Even if you drogue yourself down or, or, or helm yourself back on tidal drift, if you push a very good line on a drift and you're using a 600 grain line in 15 feet of water, there's a very good chance you're going to be coming up at a very positive gradient, but not too positive, the way that fry bolts up through the water stream, a water column. If you're a short line, you only push 45 feet. By the time you've actually waited for it to get down to a kill zone, you're on top of your fly and you're coming up vertically. So it's a very bad presentation. So in that respect, as a guide, I may well gauge the guy who's weak to go on the back and to push line to do what he can and feed and feed and feed and snake line out of his tip. So at least he gets into an area where I think a fish is going to be there. Do you see what I mean? So a technically proficient guy, I would say he will catch 70 to 80, maybe he will catch a lot more fish. And there's a number of reasons for that. First thing is his presentation is key because he's coming in the way that bolt fries up through the water column to light, so about 35 to 40 degrees. You don't see fry bolting north-south or south-north. It doesn't happen. So a long line has that as an opportunity. He can also work the water column very comprehensively, because if they're not at 15 feet, we'll try mid-water. So if he's managing deep-water fish, he can obviously, by definition, manage a mid-water fish. The other guy is exponentially limited, because one, he can't get his fly down to a kill zone. Secondly, he's on top of it and coming in inverted. So I would say the hardest thing about saltwater fly fishing, if you're on a vessel, is to get on your game. And it's always a shocker for people. You can't come centre over the boat because you're going to hit me or you're going to take a radio mast out. So you have to, one guy, unless he's a left hooker, has to reverse haul. 
But technically, that's a skill set that many people don't have. So it's a problem. I'm not saying it's a dampener. I'm saying let's get you up to speed. And most people go, how did he do that? Well, let me teach you how to do that. That's what the purpose of the school is all about. Can we perhaps throw a few figures into the mix here, looking at catch rates from both extremities of the potential on offer? Yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult question because it's a wild fishery. We hook up to an average about 2,000 fish a season. Uh, if there are 250 days in a, a year, it comes in bouts. You know, you can do a month's worth of catch in six days when the fish are seriously in an area, which is always a problem. So if somebody said to me, what am I likely to catch? I say, we are highly unlikely to catch a bass. They always seem particularly shocked about that statement because they say, well, I thought you were an IGFA captain and, and quite good at your job. I said, I said singular. I use the singular. You're either likely to be skunked or you're going to go limit up. That is the nature of the sport. They're shoaling fish, they're sociable fish. I don't think they're particularly difficult to hook up to, but they can be particularly difficult to find. If you find them, they'll normally be fairly accommodating. So it's a skewed statistic, which is always very difficult. But I would expect from June onwards for everybody to score, and some people score better than others. The, what the client doesn't seem to realise, is, which is the relationship between a professional guide and his client, is it's a partnership. I don't fish. I don't hold a rod. I might fluff up some fish without a hook on it sometimes to get them into you with a popper so you can push a line onto them. But I will put you on a bait stream I think may well be productive for you. Now, the relationship between the guide and the client is that it's now up to you to hook up. And if you can only push me 30 feet, it's going to be a very long day. So when you ask the question again, my question would be, how many competent clients do you get that can actually participate and uphold their part of the deal? And that is far more of a relationship which is understood if you work on the eastern seaboard, as I do, because it's a very mature fishery. It's also been going a long time, and the expectation of the client is much, much higher because the fishing is more prolific. When you come into the UK, I still get asked on the foreshore itch, you know, when I'm unloading into my tender to go and pick up my clients, where's the trout pond when they see my fly rods? Which shows you how non-mainstream this sport is, even after an amount of time doing it. And my answer to that is, well, there's a huge pond out there just south of where we are at the moment. And they say, well, I hadn't noticed where it was. And it, well, it's called the Solon. And it's a, that is an example of how um, mainstream this is. But I would expect as the water temperatures to get warmer, more fish come in and it becomes commensurate with the water temperature and um, over the season. So there's more fish in August than there would be in June, for instance. Um, and it probably crescendos in September. Um, even if you are technically weak, I would expect you to see fish, which I think is always a very important aspect of increasing a client's confidence to say, he didn't hook, I, did you see that one come in? Because they're like rocket fuel when they come into you. Maybe your presentation was wrong, maybe your line was short, but generally speaking, they're a highly inquisitive species and they will grace your line, whether you hook them or not, they will show you themselves. So there's a number of things that are going on there. I mean, total skunked blank days happen. They're probably no more than a handful, whereby you cannot work out exactly why you are not hooking up. That happens to all of us in all sorts of... It's rare, but, you know, certainly if you get the wrong wind and you get a polar wind like a northeast breeze or an easterly breeze, it seems to shut fisheries down, whether it's freshwater or sea. But a good day, 50, 60 bass. An exceptional day, best day we had last year in 2011, I think it was 125 in three hours. The best quality day I had last year was I had, um, I think, 14 or 15 fish, nothing under five pounds, up to eight or nine pounds. But generally, I'd expect you to have half a dozen fish each if you're wading, um, and they would be school bass stockies. Sometimes that is very, very busy. Sometimes you can have a very, very busy hour. Um, but generally speaking, if I put you in an area, if you can push your lines, I would expect you to be, yeah, hooking up without a doubt. And, um, the drift is a different matter. The drift is usually offered to people who know exactly what they're doing and what to expect. So I probably wouldn't... I expect more blanks on drifting days in relation to if it's a client I don't know. So if he insists on a drift, and I, that's the first introduction I get to that particular client in terms of technically how proficient are you. It might sound a slightly impertinent question, but understand me, everybody always lies to you because no one wants to be seen to be bad. What they fail to say is, I've been fishing for 35 years, and they forget the word badly. So the part of the school is to help you along the way. And the more information I can garner from a conversation a week before, 
prior to your booking will help me tremendously position you in an area which is more conducive to you because I can put you on fish. I can't hook your fish. So it's a weighted question and I think it's for the listener to understand that the the more honest they are with themselves and myself, the more they're going to get out of a day. If I gave you a spreadsheet and said, okay, fine, you know, I need you to work out this, are you Excel orientated? And you say yes, and I come back an hour later and you're going, okay, I don't know how to work the cells in column B, you wouldn't keep the job. In exactly the same way, if you're open and honest with me, and it's a working partnership, it's going to be more fruitful than me suddenly going out there, and don't get me wrong, it has happened, when I think a guy is rolling his line to straighten his line out, to get him out a load out of his tip on 30 feet, and I turn around to him and say, we're good to go. And he says, that's what I've got. I say, well, that's going to be a very long day then. So the guy's job is not to be subservient. It's a, it's a very different job to a ghillie. It's a self-employed job whereby it's necessary for the client to understand their strengths and weaknesses along the way in order for you to have a good day because it's supposed to be fun. And I get the impression sometimes that it's not always interpreted that way around. It's not a traditional fishing charter. It is quite a skilled partnership at which those people that can do the job do better than those people that can't. But it's an interesting one throughout the season. Certainly when it comes to catches, like I said, I, I made the inference that the catches increase exponentially really as the, as the water potentials um, increase, which they do. If you're having a bad September, October, you're not going to see any more fishing, put it that way. They come in commensurate with water temperature and if that spikes at 18 degrees 19 degrees and it's bad in in september then it's a bad season full stop so um if they can do their job they have a better than average chance being weighted in their favor to hook up yeah now you mentioned earlier catch limits well catch limits i mean i, I practice catch and release i always have done Certainly, if you're working within a, in a bass nursery zone, um, the law is, is on the catch and release side. It's, it's illegal, for instance, to cull a fish from a motorized vessel within a bass nursery zone. It's a heavy fine if caught, and, um, you know, it's a boat impoundment for the skipper. So, in that respect, it's mandatory to not cull. If you're working offshore, and we work offshore quite a lot, I have absolutely no objection to a client taking a brace of fish. But they need to understand as well that that fish needs to be of a required size and limit in terms of its length, which for me is between 46 and 48 centimetres in length. It means it's more than likely going to be male or female, but uh, you know, above five pounds those fish tend to be female. Um, it will have reproduced once, if not already twice, so it's reproduced into its gene pool, and it's fair game. But to go on a cull... And there are many occasions where we're hooking up and it gets very busy very quickly. And, you know, you could have very easily taken two or three dozen bass. Important for the listener to understand that bass by, especially mature bass, don't, they are not there by default. They are there because that's where they live. They come back year and year to an area, not like salmon where they were born, but where their sexual maturity happened at a moment in time along the coastline. So if you think we had a red letter day on a mark, don't confuse that with that was by chance those fish were there. They are there not by default, they are there because that's where they return to. So if you indiscriminately cull in an area, it will take an amount of time to repopulate and quite a long time because the fish is obviously very slow growing. Now I take it you're Chichester bears for a reason. But if you go back to your first question, you know, how was the school developed? It was developed by default. So I came back to the village I was born in, having semi-retired. My parents are still in this village. My family's in this village. And it's a bit like Groundhog Day coming back. And that happened first before the school was built. Fortunate enough to have spent my childhood on the south coast. So I knew, I didn't know the sea very well because I was never a sort of fly fisherman. I was never a fly fisherman in actual fact. I was a coarse fisherman. And I used to love going out on the occasional charter from Littlehampton or Portsmouth with my father. But it became a natural progression for me once I realised there was a demand for whatever I wanted to do. I started fly fishing uh, really by about 1990 after university. I bought a fishery in 1996 and ventured that, which was a first introduction into salmon fishing and did a bit of trout fishing before that. So I wasn't, I, you know, I haven't been born with a fly rod in my hand, but it was 1999 I first ventured down the beach and I saw the full potential of some of the intertidal zone, which is a very expansive area 
which on a spring tide can be relatively dangerous, I guess, if you're not used to your tides, but certainly an accessible area for somebody with a fly rod to wander out seven or eight or 900 metres. Certainly on some of the bigger tides, you can push your line over the lobster pot line. So you have a huge, vast, optionated intertidal zone, which is offering good hunting ground for stock and fish. And uh, it was an evening in September in 1999 when I was first introduced to it, and I don't know why I didn't take the dog for a walk or took a fly rod. I can't tell you why I took a fly rod, and I can't tell you why I actually chose that tide. I don't think I did. It was all by default. I went out there, and, and a, a shoulder bass was hunting over the ground on the flood. I hooked up to six or seven fish. They were quite nice fish, between three and five or six pounds. I took two fish myself, which are the only two fish I've really ever taken. They took the mickey out of me walking along the beach, I remember, walking past a couple of beach casting guys, and they sort of said to me, the trap ponds are that way, mate. I ignored them, got my waders on, walked out, and uh, I could hear bass in front of me. And uh, didn't really know how to, you know, I knew how to work my line technique. I didn't understand the strip rate. I didn't understand not to strike a fish, and which I think I'd probably end up with a lot more had I not raised my tip on these fish. But this was the first learning curve to suddenly understanding that what there was here, what this natural resource that I had always had in my back pocket, maybe was a commodity or a resource that could be introduced to people so you know it was that and then three or four years after that I, I, I found me withdrawing from the city environment um, having bought those domain names and therefore I put two and two together and thought okay but maybe I can introduce this to as many people as I possibly can for them to enjoy what is naturally theirs by birthright which is crown estate you don't have to pay for it so are there any specific advantages to be had by being based on such a large natural harbour with two similar inlets immediately to the west of it at Portsmouth and Langston. Strangely enough, I mean, I've never worked them. This is often the problem when you become a specialist in your area. I couldn't answer that honestly because I, I've never worked them. I couldn't say we've got a marginal advantage in Chichester Harbour. I know in Chichester Harbour it's a very beautiful area and it's the equivalent of an SSSI. It has a number of intertidal zone bars that show themselves to you at certain stages of the tide, which, which are, you know, easy to access. I say easy, respectfully, you can access them knowing what you know. The guy's job, remember, is to watch your back on tide. You crack on with the fishing. Let me worry about your tide. And I think that, um, as well as being a beautiful area to, uh, to operate in, it's as safe as you could want it to be in terms of the topography and the ground is, is good muscle bed. It's good shingle gravel. It's firm underfoot touch wood we haven't had a problem there and I think as a first stage to being introduced to it I mean we've got clients this week which are coming in for the first time they generally want to wade and to get them into an isolated environment in the middle of what seems to be the open sea wading for fish is a thrill for them anyway but in terms of is it any better than anywhere else I would say that the south coast isn't the best ground for quality fish I think you need structured ground you know, knowing what I know now, I mean, if I venture over to the Isle of Wight and travel west, we, uh, they have what we haven't got. We've got an intertidal alluvial floodplain. They have a 100 foot or 60 or 80 foot within a 100 foot cast, especially on the north facing side. And they've also got the element of a prevailing wind on the east side being very sheltered. So their clarity of water usually on the prevailing wind is, is absolutely cracking. Unlike with us, where it's always we are always reverse hauling because we're always faced with the wind coming on the right hand side. So if you're a, a right hooker, you're going to naturally migrate your technical part of your cast to a reverse haul. Otherwise, you're going to be hooking yourself in your right ear. So I would say it's more testing here. But it is an area that I've got to explore. It has offered up some fantastic opportunities for people coming in. I think, as you, you've you got to remember, it's like manufacturing a fishing rod. I don't manufacture a fishing rod for me. I manufacture a fishing rod for somebody else. Or I don't manufacture what I can use. So when it comes to a school, you're actually trying to introduce people to an area which may not be the best area, but it's the best training ground for them. I'm expecting my clients to move from the training ground into using the information and going back to where they came from and putting that into practice. They may well have better ground than me, but in order to build their confidence, I think it's a superb place to do that. To flesh that out a little bit more now, what is it that you and your clients, who may later go their own way, should be looking for in terms of ideal bass habitat? Well, I mean, certainly I think the first thing you've got to look for is, is you've got to look for ground which is being disturbed by water flow. If you went to an estuary, for instance, what is an estuary? Well, an estuary is a gaping great hole in landmass which will have a restricted tidal flow in it. 
which will give you tidal flow, tidal current. Bass is a highly expedient hunter, and it will work on the basis of what I call marginal advantage. So it will wait for food to be presented to it. If it doesn't have to hunt, it won't hunt. So when you look at looking for an opportunity to present a line, then let's look for an area of water which is disturbed by either land mass or tidal flow, one of which usually works in unison with one another. And an estuary would be a perfect place to start. Once you've isolated where you think tidal flow will be offered, then you need to probably go and approach that mark in a very big tide, but probably not with a fly rod to start with. So take a digital camera, perfect these days to just take digital content. When I look at areas, I actually use Google Earth to isolate darker ground, deeper ground, or areas that may not be as very obvious to you when you're right in front of them, as long as you can't see the woods of the trees, but certainly to isolate darker arteries of water and to take shots of an area on low water spring, which will give you the backbone of what you are working over, maybe at mid-flood or mid-ebb. I haven't found there's a tremendous amount of difference between working in tidal flow ebbing or flooding, which we'll probably go on to a little bit later. Some marks work on flood, some marks work on ebb. But generally speaking, if you've got tidal flow, you have an opportunity. So in order to see the contours of what is only a snapshot of time on a piece of water or ground, especially if it's in tidal, Take your digital camera and take shots of what you may well forget. So you can approach that water. So if you said, okay, fine, you've got to pick a coefficient tide, which is a tide which is lower than one meter on astronomical low. Uh, some of those big tides in this area are 0.3s, only, only 30 centimeters above astronomical historical data. Take the shot and go and visit it again, knowing where you should be presenting your line. Because the crease of water will allow you to know that the feature is there, but it might not show you exactly what you should be doing at, at any moment in time. So you can make reference to that. And we tend to find that there is definitely a productive time, and it's happened on the data that we've tabulated over the many years, usually starts to pick up at about one and a half hours. We work, before I say that, we work because we work a school. We've got to get you to the mark. We've got to get you kitted up. We've got to get you chilled out. We've got to then get your confidence up and then we get you fishing. So the way that that works on the, on the school is we get to a mark and we meet about two hours before low water. We normally hook up on air as well as we're losing tidal flow. Okay, fish are moving out with, with food. We then get you in a position where you're chilled out because you've got losing water around your, your ankles. We will then go and approach the water moving what could be if you're south face northing further south. So you're going to meet the fish at the narrowest point. And then you retreat with type of me behind you. So I'm commanding you, hold, don't retreat too quickly. If you retreat too quickly, you're constantly in front of food that's coming in with fish. So a big guy, six foot eight, don't get me wrong, has a marginal advantage because he's out there the longest. And if I'm five foot seven and I can definitely negotiate that stream, well, I guarantee you can as well. My job is to say, no, you wait, you, you you continue to work your lines. You come in, you retreat 10 foot at a time, 10 foot at a time, until I say, now we're good to go, we need to move. So it's interesting because we don't work high water. So once you've isolated your ground, take your shots, try and interpret the data that those shots over time are going to give you. And then unfortunately, there's no easy way but to continue to put time into an area that you think may be productive you will then build a picture of scoring you'll probably build a picture more than likely of not scoring but data that is negative is still data and I'm very numeric when it comes to plotting why I'm scoring when I'm scoring and there's definitely in our area in certain marks that we work there is definitely a trigger point on tide and it used to happen and it still happens actually at plus one and a half to plus three hours flood which is the Time the tide is building on flood. And in actual fact, on certain areas, it works in exactly the same time when you're losing on ebb tides. But you have to put your time in to find that. So what would you do? I'd isolate an area that is being interrupted, that is being distorted, where tidal flow is artificially being created at a certain time on that tide. Take shots on low spring. Interpret the data so you've got it in your back pocket. Don't take a fly with you the first time or the second time. Watch what the water flow does and then slowly build up a visual interpretation of what you are doing when you cannot see the topography of the ground and work the ground extremely comprehensively. Find yourself in a position which is safe. Always negotiate your transit point so you might have to go through a few furrows to get to the area of ground which at that moment in time may be dry so you get there for low water waiting for food to come back onto you. And remember once flooded you cannot see those furrows and a six inch furrow when you're belly button deep in surf 
is enough to put it over your weighted top. So what we do is we, we gauge our transit points on static data on the beach. So for instance, if I line up a lobster pot with, let's say, the last channel marker on the beach front or a groin, then that is my transit point at a certain amount of time. Don't do it with stuff that moves. Don't do it on a shingle bank or anything that could possibly be pushed over the course of a winter period because this all the whole topography moves, maybe 50 or 60 feet in a season on a bad winter. So you have to have something which is anchored in order to get that transit point. And it takes a certain amount of balls actually to sit in an area knowing that you're deliberately cutting yourself off. Don't get me wrong. It's not for the faint-hearted. But what I would say is tell someone where you are. Always retreat earlier rather than later. Be due diligent about what you do when you isolate a mark. There are a number of things. Once you've isolated your mark and you've found that you think, oh, that looks a fairly sexy piece of water, let me take some digital shots of what that's shown to me. At that point, it gets more interesting and you've got to be more due diligent. Don't access water without knowing what time the tide is moving, okay? Absolute no-no. Remember, even the tide table is indicative of a prevailing southwesterly breeze, which is my area, at five knots. If the tide is kicking in 25 knots, it's going to come early. It's not going to come later. So your negotiating transit points are going to be earlier. And it's going to be a higher high water and maybe a lower low water on the big tides. So when it says point three, it's point three when everything else is remaining equal. Ceteris paribus, nothing is changing at this moment in time if your natural environment is very stable. You've only got to move a couple of parameters for that maybe not to be the case. So I would always tell someone where I'm going to be even to the point where I radiate into Solon Coast Guard now to say I'm isolating. If you get calls from mariners saying there are guys in an SOS signal, that's probably us double hauling, but it's nice to know that people are looking out for you in the first place. But don't be embarrassed about it. Tell people we're going to this area. Fish maybe with someone else. If you know that low water is at 6 a.m. in the morning and you get a rolling sea fog coming in and it comes in before you, or if that came in and you didn't know what time low water was, that would cause you a much bigger problem than it would do if you did know what it was. Because if it happened at 4 o'clock in the morning and you're accessing, I don't know, at the third week in June of Mark and it's 4.30, it's light, you can work marks, and you know that you have an hour and a half of ebbing tide for that water volume to lose around your ankles, that's far more relaxing than not knowing exactly what the tide is doing. Some people turn around and which, which way, say, which way is it moving? How do you know? You've got a fog on you. You've only got to target a fish and turn around 180 degrees or another 270 degrees, hook one there, hook one there, hook one there, hook one there. You turn around, you have no concept of where your horizon is. And sometimes, remember, you can move out to sea and it gets shallower. And you move back into the foreshore and it gets deeper, which is enough to spook you because that's not the natural way around. Okay, so knowing when low water is, is absolutely imperative. So, yes, you need structured ground, um, or you need ground that is offering you, or the fish, an opportunity to trap bait. That's what I'm talking about. When I, when I talk about fishing areas, it has to be in relation to, well, you want to interpret back to, okay, fine, what's happening with the food stream? What's happening with the bait stream? You wouldn't expect bass to be somewhere where it is not offered an opportunity. So what we're saying is, okay, fine, is an area able to offer a larder of food at a moment in time? And if the answer to that is yes, then you need to put time into it, because... All bass do is follow food. And, or they stage in areas which is offering an opportunity on food at a moment in time. And don't expect to be static. Many people sit there waiting for a fish to meet them. I would suggest you go meet the fish because you're probably, I mean, there are many occasions where we've hooked into the same shoal of fish over three hours. We're moving with it. We're drifting with it. And a mark might offer a staging opportunity for a fish at 45 minutes flood that is no longer there an hour and a half because the tidal flow is over the top of it. So it's not causing a crease of water or a confluence of water that is trapping food. That fish knows that, and it moves to another area. So sometimes you can actually work with fish going into an estuary if you're working flood. And remember, the bigger the tides, the more you'll move. Okay, the smaller the tides, the less you'll be required to move. So it's a moving target, which makes it very difficult, unfortunately. It's not a black art. It's an interpretation of what is happening with the tidal flow of movement, the movement of food at any one moment in time. But yes, structured ground on spring tides. Um, another thing that we've noticed is that try and isolate in the early season areas which may well be covered over harder ground than softer ground. In the early season when the water temperatures are increasing and you can also get a short sharp shock in May when you get frosts, the intertidal zone is as reactionary to losing condition or losing water temperature as it is to gaining it in the height of summer. So to work over an intertidal zone which is more rocky than, let's say, sandy, it will retain temperature much better. 
So what happens is on an ebb tide, it exposes the intertidal zone. If there's an amount of, let's say, hard shingle ground, you may well find it absorbs the temperature differential better and holds it better. So when it floods in, it effectively cooks the water and boils it. So you may well find that early season, fry, because fry are cold-blooded, are sitting in an area which is maybe one and a half to two degrees warmer than the open sea. And they will herd into those areas. And a good quality fish that's returning knows where to hunt first. Any predator knows that. Okay, It's instinctive for it to go to where food is going to be readily available. In exactly the same way, you may well find that if you're working over hard mud or sand, it loses temperature very, very quickly. I mean, what a reservoir trout fisherman might call a thermocline inversion. So you get a regressive water temperature differential throughout the water column, and suddenly you get polar air coming in on a front, and they go, oh, the fish have gone off feeding. They haven't, they're not, not feeding, they're just, they've just gone lower. So put a high density line on and go into the thermocline where they were feeding, which means you've got to be fairly mobile about your thought process. All fish do is feed and reproduce. So if they're not reproducing because it's April through to October and they've already reproduced, their primary motivation is to feed, and they have to feed. And that is one thing I think, you know, maybe the listener, although a very obvious point, it doesn't have the privilege to go into the fridge and have a bacon sandwich. It has to hunt constantly because it doesn't know when the opportunity is not going to arise again. And you can use that to your advantage. So using that as to your advantage, we would say, okay, fine, let's try and look for ground that is offering you an opportunity. So... A canalised piece of water that has no structure on it may not be as conducive to hooking into a predator as an area where there's a confluence of water hitting landmass and deflecting off it, which may well trap bait. But remember, it only traps bait at a moment in time, and it will react differently at one hour or plus one hour to plus two hours to plus three hours, and then over high water. So when I wrote my notes up after five or six years, I found that there was distinctly that correlation, and that's what's in the book. It's not... The book is a reference book for parameters that you are able to control and you should be spending your time saying, I don't think that ground's going to be good enough, isolating a piece of ground and then unfortunately sieving the water over the whole lunar cycle to the point where you build a very distinct picture in terms of when you're not hooking up. And it will be probably not very obvious at first, but unfortunately the only solution to that is trial and error. And when you're fishing from the shore, is it wise then to carry a handheld GPS or VHF and still to wear a life jacket? Well, certainly as a guide, yes. If I'm on the boat, I have regulations that are imposed on me in order to kit the vessel out with safety equipment. When walking, it's very much up to you, but I would never access the foreshore without a manual release 150 newton life jacket. They need to be manual because the automatics will go off with vapour, okay, and you look like the Michelin man when you're double hauling out there. It's happened, which is why we use the manuals. I have a radio on me. Um, I have a mobile phone on me. I don't have a GPS on me. I know where I am. I think, certainly if I was accessing ground, I don't think I would access ground without being guided. I'm not saying being guided for a full week, but to say uh, to get somebody who knows their ground well for a day, a morning or an afternoon or a full tide, I think is an absolute necessity and an asset, not only in terms of safety, but in terms of, okay, fine, you know, let's interpret what I learned that day and then take yourself off yourself. But yes, safety gear is an absolute must. I still see people wading without safety equipment. If you're going to, you know, wear waders, wear a restrictive belt on your waders which will restrict water ingress should you fall over and people fall over. It's a fallacy that you get sucked down if you've got uh, water in your waders. What happens is people generally panic and what they should do is relax and float and put their boots up in the air because it traps oxygen, which means you will float and you will go back somehow to, you know, you'll be intercepted by somebody. But what happens is people tend to try and tread water when they've got waders full of water and you will build up very quickly the amount of lactic acid in your legs which will prevent you from treading water which eventually makes you sink and um, get sucked down. So the first thing to do is to try and just chill out a little bit and to assess. Now that's easier said than done. It's not a nice thing when you have tidal flow on your case and I would always say, and I, th I think I said it sort of like half an hour ago, it usually happens when fish are on, funny enough, when fish are seriously busting up in front of you and uh, you are highly reluctant to leave a mark that has suddenly shown you the full fruit bowl. But there's always tomorrow and you're better off leaving the fish behind and maybe doubling back on yourself, getting back onto firm ground and intercepting which way the bait stream is going to get in front of the shoal again. It would be a mistake to push it to such an extent that you get wet or you you know you have to somehow negotiate those furrows that are now four feet under 
So my message to anyone starting is be sensible. If you're going out on your own, tell somebody where you're going. Take a timetable with you. Kit yourself out with a manual release, hydrostatic release valve buoy that goes over your neck. And there are some good ones on the market that are very inexpensive, 30 quid, 35 quid will buy that. Which will get you out of trouble if you get light on your feet. There's no point in talking as light as in the car, I've got it. At that point, and it happens when it happens, it happens very, very quickly. So veer on caution, be kitted up. The most important thing is you. An 80 centimetre bass is not worth that, don't get me wrong. And there's always tomorrow to go and approach the quarry on the same mark. And take it steady. That would be my message. Because of the duration of this particular interview, I'm going to take the unusual step of breaking off midpoint here. Both Justin and I will be back for part two to pick up where we left off. Mm -hmm.